Welcome in to Vol Basketball Fever, your number one source for discussions about the Vols and Lady Vols basketball programs. Subscribe to the channel so you don't miss a video and check in every week for new episodes of the show, video breakdowns, and more. Now, on with the episode. Hello everyone and welcome in to a brand new episode of Vol Basketball Fever. I am Nathaniel Rutherford, joined by a special guest for this episode this week is Ryan Shumpert of Rocky Top Insider. Had him on here on the show before and wanted to get him on here again this week because it uh, worked out perfectly for the timing, Ryan, because we're recording this on Tuesday evening and Tennessee's media day for the men's side of things just finished up in basketball. So uh, Ryan, thanks for uh, coming on and, and joining me in the podcast again. Yeah, for sure. It, like you said, it was great timing. Basketball practice or men's basketball started their uh, official practice last week. And then, like you said, media day to day. So I got it fresh on the mind. It's been about, I don't know how long it would have been, four, four hours or so over talking to people and watching basketball practice today. So plenty to get to on a, a team that should, uh, should have a pretty, pretty good chance to win a lot of games and a pretty good chance to compete for a conference championship. Yeah, we'll get into some of that here in a second. But as Ryan mentioned, practice started last week, both for the Vols and Lady Vols in the same day. Uh, preseason practices started for both teams. So now both teams underway. We'll have to do, uh, hopefully, I'll have Maria Cornelius on either this week or next week to do a Lady Vols episode, also talking about what Lady Vols are looking like early on in the preseason here. But before we get started, I want to thank all of you all for tuning in, whether it's on YouTube or just the audio version only of the podcast. Thank you all so much. Go ahead and subscribe and like this video if you haven't subscribed to the channel yet and haven't already liked this video here at the start of it. Uh, we appreciate any and all engagement interaction you all give me. Uh, it's been a couple weeks since the episode, so thank you all for sticking around and tuning in. Uh, was on vacation and then also just... Last week didn't work out to do episodes, so I wanted to get back on here and what better timing than when preseason basketball started. Uh, Ryan, a lot of different questions I wanted to ask about, you know, kind of takeaways here in the first week of practice and things like that. But I want to get your thoughts first from anything that really stood out to you during the media day on Tuesday with the men's side. Because I know I saw a few different quotes and stuff from Rick Barnes. I know they had a the Twitter account had a, a Q and A going for fans to ask questions. So, uh, if, if anything, you know, biggest takeaways, anything that really caught your ear, caught your eye uh, from Media Day on Tuesday. Well, one thing that I'd say stood out from the portion where they have all the players and the assistant coaches kind of uh, on prep pavilion practice court, uh, different tables, and you can go up and talk to them. Uh, ask both Rod Clark, assistant coach, and then Justin Ganey, associate head coach. You know, what kind of stands out uh, about Indiana State transfer Tyreek Key and, you know, you know, not to say those guys were just speaking in coach speak when they're talking about other things, but there for both of them, there was kind of like a pause and like a how much do I go into it type of thing. And basically both of them said something of the effect of he's a bucket. I mean, he Rod Clark told me that he's a guy that, you know, last year when Tennessee had a lot of droughts, they didn't feel like they really had someone they could just isolate and try to get the ball and use their physicality and shooting to go get a basket. He said he thought. Tyreek Key was a guy like that, and I think that kind of further positive about a guy that there was a lot of question marks about. Not that marks of, oh, he can't play at all, but uh, three years, uh, he's coming off a season where he didn't play at Indiana State because of a shoulder shoulder injury. He's a fifth-year senior in college. He was a big-time scorer at Indiana State, but he's coming, uh, making a massive jump from the Missouri Valley Conference into the SEC, and then you look at his shooting where – I think his sophomore season, he shot like 43% from three. And he, there's massive gaps, his three-point shooting uh, between his three seasons where he played a lot and scored a lot uh, for the Cyclones. So I think hearing those things kind of really stood out to me today. This is a guy that's going to be one of the main pieces and, and one of the, maybe the, potentially one of the main scorers on this Tennessee team. And then I would say, you know, from watching practice, uh, a lot of that was backed up. His shooting stroke looked really good. He told me that really after his sophomore season uh, is when his shoulder started to bother him. And it's, and right now is the healthiest he has felt since he's been in college. And he looked really polished in his ability to score uh, this afternoon. Yeah, that was, uh, I was going to follow up, follow that up with asking you when they say he's a bucket, are they, are they muting him shooting threes or him driving in the basket? Because I know he did a lot of that too um, in Indiana State because he was a guy that averaged uh, about five free throw attempts per game from his sophomore to senior season over there um, in the Indiana State. I had him on the show uh gosh or sometime earlier this year not long after he had officially committed and signed with Tennessee and we, we talked about his shoulder then and he was coming along and yet kind of think same thing you said he talked about how it kind of started bothering him a couple of years ago and you know 
looking at the stats, as you mentioned, shot 32 percent from three as a freshman, 44.8, it's almost 45 percent from three in a second year in 18-19 season, 39 percent as a junior, then only 31.6 percent uh, two seasons ago before, as you said, he didn't play at all last year. But a guy that kind of, you know, I, I think Ryan, to me, it's hard to, I, don't, I wouldn't say he's an X factor because I, I would put that more maybe like a, a Josiah or maybe even Julian Phillips in terms of truly labeling an X factor for this team. But if Key is able to be a guy who uh, is a another scoring option for this team that already seems like they have a pretty good amount, but like you said, they struggled with consistency sometimes last year. And that's been, I guess, kind of a thing that's really plagued Rick Barnes' offense the last few years has been they go in these cold droughts where it goes five, six, seven minutes without really getting a bucket. Um, if Key is able to kind of alleviate that and have and minimize those droughts, because you're going to happen, that's going to happen, you know, at some point, your teams are going to have five, six minutes where they don't score some games, but minimizing that happening every single game. Uh, if Key is able to go out there and be an offensive, I'm going to say force, but a guy who can give you another option on offense, I mean, that opens the door so much for this team because that was something they missed last year. Um, you had best could be from three. Kennedy was, was, you know, once the season kind of got going, he was shooting better from three. And of course we saw Josiah had a brutal start from the three point range, at the beginning of the year, and then closed on an incredible uh, hot streak from three in uh, postseason play, especially if key can add to that and also be the guy that drives the bucket, like he did at Indiana state. I mean, that that's a guy Tennessee hasn't had in several years, a guy who is a, a, I guess kind of a bigger guard slash smaller forward who can drive to the bucket and finish at the rim or draw fouls. Since he hasn't had a guy like that in a few years, who's able to hopefully get ten, uh, the opponent's big men or other, you know, star players or whatever in foul trouble uh, consistently. Definitely. And I think that's probably the biggest question, you know, that I have about him is just how much does his ability to get to the basket translate uh, to this level? And because you look Tennessee, you know, for what Josiah James does really well and what Santiago Vescovi do really, really well, they're not particularly good at beating their defenders off the dribble and finishing off the basket. You have Zakai Ziegler who can do that, but you lose Kennedy Chandler, who was probably the best one uh, on Tennessee's team last year. And I think Tyreek Key gives Tennessee kind of another option, another guy that can uh, score off the dribble potentially. He's not the quickest guy, but I do think he has some sneaky athleticism. I mean, he had one uh, alley-oop today that was a really, really impressive dunk. And uh, I think his athleticism maybe surprised me a little bit, but yeah, that's definitely something that I think the shooting, you know, the question marks I had about the shooting, which again, was just, there was such a big variance uh, from what he did when he was at his best to what he did when he was struggling. I, I feel pretty good about what he's going to be able to do as a shooter. To me, the question is more, how much can he do what you just said, get to the basket, get, get to the free throw line. Cause Tennessee doesn't have a whole lot of those obvious options. And he was really, really good at that in Indiana state. Obviously, it's a different challenge now that he's in the SEC. Well, I want to ask about Julian Phillips, but I'm going to hold off because I think something that came up last week I think is a little bit more, I wouldn't say pressing, but just it's more top of mind, I think, probably for uh, Vol fans, Vol basketball fans specifically, too. And that is the point guard spot for Tennessee because there is the whole uh, quote from Rick Barnes last week that I saw going around about uh, him talking about Sakai Ziegler and uh, him saying that, you know, hey, he, he prefers coming off the bench. He likes being the guy that can come on and, be a spark for us on offense and really, you know, when he comes on, the energy level goes up. Uh, I, I haven't had a chance to see too much of what Rick Barnes has said today or yeah, today is recording this on Tuesday for media day. Was that brought up and addressed any at all today about the point guard spot? You know, what is, what is the point guard spot looking like for Tennessee right now, early on in preseason? Yeah, it wasn't really talked about broadly, maybe kind of about individuals, uh, some of those guys. And you're right to, to me, when you look at Tennessee's roster, that's the one flaw is they don't have a second point guard. And you feel really good about what Sky Ziegler is going to be able to give them, but they might be leaning on him to play 35 minutes a night. And, you know, he's probably up for the challenge, but you obviously don't want that. And then at the same time, you're an injury away from being in a lot of trouble if he were to go down. I think the three guys that are kind of your options, Tyreek Key, Santiago Vescovi, and then the freshman B.J. Edwards. B.J. Edwards really got a – Baptism by fire in the Tennessee basketball program this summer. Vescovi was off playing with his international team. Uh, and so he was one-on-one -on -one with Zakai Ziegler every single day. Uh, and I think Zakai Ziegler got the better of him pretty frequently, which you'd expect. And, I, you know, Rod Clark talked about he kind of had to encourage him, keep his head up. You know, there's a lot of guys in the SEC that can't guard Zakai. And, you know, you can't be too discouraged by that. And I think that 
is the best thing that could ever could have happened for him when you look at what B.J. Edwards is going to be able to give this team this year, which is still a massive question mark. But he got tested immediately from the time he stepped on campus. And I think he is a guy that, you know, I think he was a point guard basically every recruiting uh, – Website had him as a point guard, but I think he's kind of more of a combo guard. He's going to play some on the ball, some off the ball. So uh, I think that's a massive question mark. Vescovy, you know, he's we've seen him play there. He's had capabilities. He told me that's really been one of his main areas of emphasis all offseason is being better with the ball in his hands. But at the same time, what makes him such a special player and what we saw last year, a big part of the reason that he made a jump to an all-SEC level player was that he was off the ball I mean he's as good as anybody in the country moving without the ball and getting himself open to shoot and being in such good shape that it doesn't bother him that he runs however much he runs more than anybody on Tennessee's team and can still shoot at a really effective level to me he is the guy I think Tennessee maybe Edwards is the guy that they would love to see do it because he's a freshman and he in the future could be a point guard but I think when you look at things more realistically in the short term earlier in the season I think Tyreek he's probably the guy they're going to turn to and look to there. And, you know, he didn't play much uh, point guard uh, at Indiana State, handled the ball a little bit. Uh, but that is something he did do at high school, uh, in Clay County High School here in, in Tennessee, and was able to be a facilitator. I think that is something that he has the abilities uh, to do. But it, I think it's definitely a learning process and uh, a growing experience. And just about the only time I saw Rick Barnes get on him hard today or send him over to the Versa Climber was when he was handling the ball. Uh, and, you know, struggled a little bit at times. So I think that's going to be a learning experience. I think that it, if it does, you know, no one steps up, it could be something where you see a, a lot of those guys get little snippets, you know, a couple of possessions at a time. And, I, you know, I was talking about it with a uh, friend of both of ours, Ben McKee, watching the practice, you know, talking to your point of Zakai Wayne to come off the bench. It, it feels like it could be a situation where Zakai starts on the bench two possessions into the game, Rick Barnes is pulling for him and saying getting in there because he is going to play a lot, a lot of minutes on this team, probably more than anybody else. And right now, uh, like I said, that's kind of the one roster weakness is there's just not an obvious second point guard candidate. Yeah, it's it's never really important. I wouldn't say important, but it's, it's not as important uh, who starts as who finishes. And Zakai is going to finish the game unless he's in foul trouble or fouled out or whatever. He's finishing games. Um he may not start, like you said, but he, <laughs> I imagine if he doesn't start, like you said, he comes in the first couple minutes. Uh, as soon as there's an ability to bring a, a sub in, he's the guy that comes off the bench. But he, may, he still may start. Well, I, I'll be very interested to see what happens at the point guard. And, and following that up, um, is that are, does that kind of temper your expectations for this team? We talked about at the beginning hinting at that you know this team has some pretty high expectations. Last time Gene and I did a podcast uh, was looking at some early – early projections I think Blue Ribbon at that point had already had their preseason rankings out and Tennessee was a top 10 team on there and there was another service I want to say I had Tennessee in the top 10 or at least right around it uh, that I saw recently too does that question mark of you know who is behind Sakai Ziegler at point guard does that kind of temper your expectations because I look at the landscape of college basketball and guard play dictates most of it you, you obviously teams that have good big men are going to you know, look at what happened to Tennessee last year against Michigan. <laughs> they had a good big man and they got beat. Uh, Michigan did and, and beat Tennessee. So does it, you know, does it, does it really kind of temper your expectations of what the point guard position, or you do, do you think that they're good at other positions and that kind of, you know, the whole rising tide lifts all boats type of thing? I think that's an interesting point that you bring up just in general, because, you know, I, I think it's the basketball almanac. Uh, it's a new kind of preseason magazine. I, can't remember who has put it out so sorry that i can't give them credit but yeah it's the uh the field of 68 and like four or five other people like publications or people media outlets have kind of all gotten together to do that yeah and you know the, the title of the, the magazine this year is the year of the big man and i think that's going to be and you just look at the picture and it's like yeah man they're i hadn't thought about that but you look at all those guys that are on the cover and you're like yeah it is kind of the year of the big man so i think that's going to be and it's more of a broad topic I'm not talking about tennessee something that's kind of interesting to watch this year because uh, you're right, it is in March, it's guard play uh, that that pushes the best teams deep into the tournament. And I think when you look really at what you asked me, and does that timber my expectations? I think, and then I don't know if timbered expectations, question mark, it, I think concern, my hold off on, on this team saying, like, yeah, they're for sure top 10 team is how do they replace Kennedy Chandler? And I think that's one, just what you said. You, you don't, you didn't bring in an obvious point guard candidate to replace them. And you don't have, Tennessee was so good with their ability to play Zakai and Kennedy at the same time last year. 
and have multiple ball handlers on the court and be really aggressive offensively and you know, really make over aggressive defenses pay. So I think that's kind of part of it. And then two, uh, when you look at past kind of the lack of depth they have there, Kennedy Chandler just did so much to create Tennessee's offense. Uh, you know, he, uh, I think created somewhere in the 65 to 70% range when it, between assist and points of Tennessee's offense last year. And as Kai Ziegler, as good as he was, he wasn't near the passer that Kennedy Chandler was. It wasn't near the facilitator. And so I think that's something that as good as I think this team is, as talented as I think this team is, as high as I think their potential is, that's one thing that's kind of just makes me hold off on going all in on him is because I think it's, it can easily be one of those things where you lose him and you don't lose else and you bring in some nice pieces. And that's why I and just about everybody else think this team is going to be really good and be one of the best uh, two or three teams in the SEC. But I think Kennedy had such an impact on this team that it could be easy to overlook it and overlook how big of a loss that would be. And I think when you combine that with the fact that not only did Tennessee not bring in any point guard that's Kennedy Chandler's caliber, they didn't really bring in a point guard period that they know they can rely on. Uh, so that's going to be, to me, a, a big thing to watch. And I think you're right that it's just kind of, I don't know if it tempers my expectations, but it's just kind of like a shadow over the team that at any time, if Ziegler goes down, uh, there could be some, some serious issues. Yeah. I, I, or if, I'm he's, right in, or if he's in foul trouble because yep. he's, he likes to reach. He plays really <laughs> aggressive on defense and he gets away with it a lot because I think probably because of his size. Um, but that's going to be something that I think is worth watching this year. And, you know, we know Rick Barnes is very conservative about playing his guys when they get two fouls, how he handles that and how Zakai adjusts to really needing to be available for his team. Like we said, at least 30 minutes a game and very easily a lot of nights, it's going to be 35 plus minutes. Yeah. Last year, uh, Ziegler, I'm trying to pull the stats really quick. He was on, on the team. He averaged some of the highest, I think, fouls per game on the team for, let's see here. No, he averaged 1.7. It's not one of the highest, but he's still, I mean, that feels a little low to me. <laughs> I, mean, it's, I mean, it's accurate, but he, he averaged just a little, a little under two fouls per game. But, um, but yeah, no, I mean, you're right that he does like to reach. He's very aggressive with his defense, which is most of the time good, but it can be, like you said, you can still get you some, depending on who the officials are that night, some very ticky-tack fouls sometimes. Uh, well, you mentioned it there the almanac, as you said, is the big man, uh, the year of the big man. Well, how about Tennessee's big men? Because I personally, I wouldn't say my hopes are like sky high, but I I do have high hopes for Olivier Camwa in terms of as long as he's healthy, just some of the the growth we saw from him last year. Um, the beginning of the year looking good against inferior competition, then struggled against better competition, and then it really seemed like he was starting to hit his stride and play better against SEC schools, especially. And then he gets hurt in the South Carolina game and then you know, never is able to come back. Um, I personally have high hopes for him as a, a stretch four type of guy, a guy who can bring a lot to the table on both sides of the ball. He was also doing really well defensively last year before he got hurt. But then you also have Urosh. Uh, you have another year of progress and hopefully some weight gaining for Jonas Adu as well. You can, I guess you can throw Julian Phillips in there in the big man conversation because he's six eight, six nine, but I don't really count him as a, a true post player. But I'll be, I'll, I'll ask about him specifically in a second, just kind of talking about him in, in specific. But he, you might want to throw him in here too, if you want to. But from what you've seen the first week and from what Barnes and, and the coaches have said, you know, what are the the big guys looking like? Because that's that's the area this year where I think Tennessee has more experience. They're, they're an experienced front court. I just, I, I don't know that you you have a whole lot there that you know exactly what you're going to get. I guess you know what you're going to get from Arosh. I'll say that. I don't think you're expecting the world from him. You know what you're going to get from him. I mean, he was steady last year and was a pretty good bench player for you last year and made some you know starts here and there too. But I think with Kamwa, the big question is, if, is he healthy enough to reach his potential? What is Adu's potential and can he reach it? And then uh, obviously you have... Um, uh, uh, a walk in there, but I believe he's probably going to red shirt. I don't, I don't, but I don't know that I've heard a lot of good things from him over the off season as well from, you know, summer workouts and things like that. And summer just conditioning and all that different stuff. So what are the big men looking like and kind of, how are they kind of projecting out here in early October? Yeah, I would, I would start with a walk. I, you know, I don't know this for sure, but I think he'd probably be a, a red shirt candidate. And I, I do think it's probably going to be those three guys, Olivier, uh, a, a do and then uh, Euros. I, I think those are the three main guys, and, and that's kind of the good thing. Is Tennessee has, you know, I I don't think Julian Phillips. I wouldn't throw him into that that boat. I think he's more of a wing guy. But Tennessee has such versatility with him and Josiah that I think by February last year you saw Tennessee lean into playing those four guard lineups. 
see that from the start this year. And I asked Rick Barnes about it today, and he said that he thinks probably so, that this is his most versatile team that he's had since he's at Tennessee. And, I mean, we know what Josiah can do defensively with his versatility, which is just such a, such a, a massive weapon. And, you know, made him, even last year when he was struggling offensively before he turned it on, I thought the second most important player on Tennessee's team because he does so much well. Uh, and, and Julian Phillips, you know, I think the defense is – to be determined, to be seen how good he's going to be. But the versatility is definitely there. I mean, his – his, I mean, he just looks like an NBA wing player. With his wingspan, I mean, it is – he has some long, long arms. And obviously, I think that bodes well for his ability not to be able to guard, you know, true fives, but to guard fours and to guard guys like this, stretch fours in the SEC. So, I think that takes the pressure off of that group, uh, big man group. And for me, with Olivier, it's all about consistency. It's about him being able to do what, take what he does at practice and put it into games and do it consistently and not just do it against inferior competition. And I think it's all about mentally him being really sharp and knowing what to do with the ball and him not being tentative. And I think that's just, we've always seen that from him. Even you go back to his first couple of years when he played, you know, 10 minutes a game, that was always his issue. And it was better last year. I mean, he was definitely a better player. It wasn't as big as an issue. But there were nights where he just looked lost still. And I think Tennessee really needs to find some consistency with him because I think he is, you know, for his, you know, John Fulkerson, you know, never became the guy that he was that stretch in his junior season when he was an all-SEC player. He was a guy that for the most part last year you had some consistency from. And he, you, Jonas Adu, he's a young guy. You don't know really what you're going to – He's still in that stage where you expect inconsistency, I guess I would say. So Olivier is a senior now. Can he put it all together consistently? Because the talent level is certainly there. And then, yeah, with Adu, I mean, he's his shooting, you know, looks better. I'll be interested to see if they trust him, the, give him the green light to shoot threes by the start of the season. But really, I think with him, and I think what's exciting when you combine, because he never, he didn't really play much until Olivier got hurt last year. And that his injury gave uh, Jonas opportunities. Those two guys are, are both really good rim protectors. I mean, we obviously saw it a lot uh, with Adu against, you know, Oscar Shibway in Kentucky. But both those guys are really, really talented rim protectors. And I think almost give Tennessee an element in their defense that they didn't have uh, for a lot of last year, at least when Olivier went down, because Jonas was only playing 10, 15 minutes a game. And a lot of his, his world changed by game, I guess you would, could say. And I think his understanding of what Tennessee wants – the fact that Fulkerson is gone, the fact that Brandon Huntley Hatfield is gone, he's going to see more minutes this year. And I think the fact that the two guys that you bring back and play are going to play the most minutes, maybe Euros plays just as much many minutes as they do. But both those guys, I think, are really good defensively. And I think for a Tennessee team that returns a lot of really good uh, defensive pieces on the, at the wing and then obviously a point guard with Ziegler, who was Tennessee's first ever uh, freshman to land on the all-SEC defensive team. It makes a, a chance for this team to be really, once again, really, really special on defense and to kind of be able to throw some different elements at teams that while they were really, really good the last two years, uh, or I mean last year, I guess, uh, they, they weren't able to throw. So a, a couple of things there. I, I do, I, I've always – I've said this about him a lot, and I don't think it's like a unique thought because I've seen other people – fans and media say it too uh, to me he I, I see him as like a a higher ceiling Kyle Alexander from a rim protecting standpoint and what he does on offense I, I think his offense is already a little bit further along especially from where uh Alexander was as a true sophomore I think Adu's is ahead of that but I think defensively you know in the way he's able to move and the athleticism he has it reminds me a lot of what Alexander was able to do in his four years at Tennessee but I think you made a really good point there that I hadn't really thought about looking at last year's team and then looking at what this year's team does. You know, as you said, Adu was a guy who was a rim protector, um, but only played, you know, like you said, a, a few minutes a game, even when he got the more opportunities because uh, it just wasn't, wasn't ready last year. I mean, it just is what it is. He was a true freshman who they weren't playing a whole lot until he had to be played. And then he was doing better. But I, I think it's, at the point you said like, that I didn't think about really was that you have him and Kamwa both, who both guys are capable rim protectors. Uh, I know the per game things from last year aren't going to show as much because, um, again, Adu would play just a few minutes sometimes and, and that would count as a game, but then he wouldn't get a whole lot of stats. But last year before Kamwa got hurt, he was averaging over a block per game. And we saw Adu when he came in multiple times had multiple multi-block games. Um, 
those are guys that, you know, I don't expect them to go out and then do quite what uh, Alexander did because Alexander finished um, pretty high up Tennessee's career blocking record list uh, by the time he finished his, his st- stint at Tennessee. I don't expect those guys to, you know, challenge, you know, Tennessee's career blocking record or anything, but, um, or, you know, Eve Pons did too, but obviously that's a much different type of blocker. Um, that's a good point though. I, I think as long as, uh, that's the biggest thing, biggest question about Cam Law is does his injury kind of feed into that uh, timidity that we saw him have, as you mentioned, that, that was kind of his biggest drawback was that he wasn't aggressive and wasn't, didn't play physical enough. And we saw that start to be more, uh, even do that more during games last year before his injury. And now I'm a little worried. Does that injury kind of get in the back of his head? Cause sometimes it does with athletes or with anybody, you get that in the back of your head. So, Oh no, you know, I gotta be careful. I, I don't want to tweak this again. I don't want to do that. And you know, hurt myself again. Right, I know it's only been a week in practice, but I'm curious if you've seen anything from him from a mentality standpoint or any any of the big guys from a mentality standpoint that stood out to you. I don't think I've seen any tentativeness, and I, I talked to him about it today that you know he played with the Finland uh, national team this summer, and he talked about you know how beneficial that was for him to come off the injury and be able to get some experience and be able to get some game experience uh, before you know they get into the season, and I think that kind of allowed him to to knock some of the rust off and kind of get his feet wet again. And I don't think I've seen, you know, any tentativeness from him, but again, that's, he's been a good practice player for a long time. It's been about Mm -hmm. him taking what he can do in prep pavilion and taking it onto the the court at the summit at Thompson bowling arena. So I don't foresee that being a major issue, but I, I guess you never know until you really see it on the court. Yeah. That's a good point. That's a very good point. All right. Let's talk about, the man, uh, I guess the, maybe even the kid, he's, he's pretty young. Uh, Julian Phillips, we've danced around him a little bit. We've kind of hinted at him here and there. I, I agree with you, by the way. I, I would not put him in the big man category. We've talked about that ad nauseum here on the podcast with Gene, that he's not a – he may have the height of a big man, but he's not a big man. He's more of a wing. What have the coaches been saying about him? And you mentioned just his measurables alone, he looks like an NBA player. Um, I know you guys, you got to watch a lot of practice today uh, on Tuesday, but, I, you know, it's – preseason practice and there's only so much you can tell during practice in any sport but i feel like especially in basketball it's kind of hard to emulate a, a real game experience um i don't say well i don't say it's super i don't know but my, my point to get on this is it's it's still very early on we're in early october but what have the coaches been saying is i've saw different quotes i think from barnes and stuff talking about just his work ethic seems to be there uh it seems to be like some of the you know some of the best rick barnes players at tennessee had really really good work ethic and it seems like julian phillips is uh, from what I've seen from Barnes, and I think one of the assistants, I don't remember which one it was now, mentioned it too, that you know he's put in the work already. They, they can tell that he's been a student of the game. So what, what's been kind of the early returns on Julian Phillips from you know anything you've heard and seen? He just seems like he doesn't have an ego, which you know is always, I think, a question with, with a five-star recruit. And especially like you look at how his recruitment went. You know, He committed to LSU early, and obviously I think a lot of people in Knoxville don't have, didn't have a very positive opinion of that program when Will Wade was still running it. And then obviously he, he decommits when Will Wade gets fired and the very long drawn out recruitment, even then where he took a bunch of visits and it seemed to kind of be a roller coaster, but none of that may not do that stuff necessarily. The kid is going to be a diva or there's going to be a lot of drama, but you just wonder when that there's a situation like that. And, and I've seen none of it. And Rick Barnes certainly hasn't seemed to, uh, see any of it or be displeased by anything because you're right he's been very complimentary of his work ethic and i think you know maybe the thing that stands you know i could the best thing i could say about him from what i saw today and this isn't going to sound like much but those that have followed the rick barnes program know how much it means is rick barnes wasn't yelling at him a lot today and most freshmen are they're going through the ringer and they are making a lot of mistakes and rick barnes is all over them a lot the only time i really can remember him getting after him today was uh, when you know he's going off some double screens and, and called for a switch, and Barnes was getting on him about that's not what they wanted to do. But that wasn't the point of them calling that play against them, basically. But besides that, he just seemed to know what he was doing, be in the right spot, uh, knowing his responsibilities, doing what he's supposed to do. And I think when you look at him on the offensive side of the ball, really good shooting stroke. Uh, you know, again, like I talk about his mold of being an NBA player, he just looks like a three and D guy, and. I think the question, you know, he finished well off of some cuts today and made some nice finishes around the rim. I think my question is, how else does he get involved in the offense? Because I don't think he's going to be a guy that 
beach defenders off the dribble very much. Is he? A, I think a lot of his skill set reminds me of Jabari Jabari Smith, and that's not saying it's Jabari Smith. Jabari Smith was probably the best player in the SEC last year, if not maybe Oscar Sheway had him. He was one of the best players in the SEC. But how did they use him? I think his skill set is similar to what Jabari Smith had. Did they get him a lot of uh, opportunities to kind of face up and shoot o- over defenders in the mid range? That's something that I'll, I'll be interested to see. But uh, from day one, it, he wasn't a guy that stood out a ton in a good way. And I think his his shooting stroke is what you would hope it would be for a guy that, like you, like we just said, you know, six eight, six nine, whatever he is. But he's not really a big man. He doesn't bring it back to the basket game. Uh, that he kind of brings you would hope if you don't have a back to basket game and you're that size that you're a pretty good shooter and, and that's what and what I've been able to see I think you're right I mean I think most people listening to this podcast would key in on what you just said I, I think it's huge that he, him as a freshman hasn't gotten screamed at by Rick Barnes a ton <laughs> that that really that that speaks a lot to me from what you said I mean more than anything you can see in a practice court about him shooting and, and anything else like that I mean the fact that Barnes already seems like they you know, he's put in the work to not be yelled at, basically. I mean, you, you hear a lot of the guys who played last few years are Grant, Admiral, Jordan Bone. They talked about how, you know, how kind of a rough a transition it was from freshman. We saw the Admiral, I mean, he got suspended uh, his early on in his career at Tennessee uh, and, and just kind of the, the growing pains there. If you can come in as a freshman and not have a ton of growing pains uh, in terms of at least, you know, the culture standpoint, that's huge um, because, like you said, it, it's I think it's interesting. I'd I, I guess the viewers here on YouTube probably didn't see it because they're, I think the screen is focusing on you. But when you said he hasn't, doesn't have an ego, I kind of jumped back. I was like, really? Like, that's just, you don't see that from most five stars. And not, not just, he goes, Josiah was a five star, but not just a five star, but a guy who is a consensus top 15 five star guy who had, you know, a, a true like high end five star type of guy. You don't see that very often. And not to say that they're all divas and they're all, you know, me, 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 but there's some there, there's there's a neat there, there, who was uh the, i can't remember the guy's name but the the like the most people assume the number one overall pick in this upcoming like draft was they're talking to him and they asked about the number two guy and he's like yeah man he's like i think you know if i wasn't born he'd be the number one guy <laughs> it's like that just what a what a quote like that was just such a powerful like great confidence in himself but also like wow <laughs> uh like i just it's just cool to me that julian you know I haven't talked to him on the show. I talked to one of his coaches on the show, and I, I don't remember if they'd said that about him or not, but um, that's cool. I mean, I, I I think, I don't know how much you've been able to see him defensively. I, I would be curious to see what he can do on defense because I, I do think, I agree with you, I think his offensive skill set is going to be very versatile um, and, and can do things that Jabari Smith did do on offense last year. Again, I don't think he'll beat Jabari Smith. I don't know that we have the opportunity to beat Jabari Smith like Jabari was because I don't think he... You know, Jabari, the roster Auburn had last year presented Jabari with immediate opportunity to start. I don't know that Julian Phillips starts for this team this year, at least not at the beginning of the year. We'll, we'll see. But, you know, I'm, I, th- I think we all know with Rick Barnes, the way you get on the court is through defense. So have you seen any, have you heard anything or seen anything about Julian's defense? Because I think that's going to be obviously a big separator between whether or not he plays 10, 15 minutes in a game or if he's going to play 20, 25 minutes in a game. Yeah, I, mean, I really can't, you know, don't have a ton to speak to that uh, at this point. Uh, he certainly has uh, all the potential, uh, and I think the capabilities, you know, how the buy in the buy-in seems to be there. I feel like, you know, if the buy-in wasn't there, we would have heard about it by now. You know, that would be a talking point, and you're not going to play for Rick Barnes if your buy-in isn't right uh, on the defensive end. So uh, it's not something I, you know, necessarily have focused on uh, watching to this point, but uh, I think it will be something interesting to watch going forward because – just like we said, you know, that versatility Tennessee has, that versatility that Josiah Jordan James brings Tennessee is because of how defensively and physical and up for really any challenge. And I think if Phillips is able not to be Jos- as good as Josiah is defensively, but to embrace the challenge and be capable defensively, that just opens up a, a world of opportunities for this Tennessee team lineup wise and, and really the way they can attack you offensively to have guys like that who, who can. You're not because again, you look at Tennessee's big men. You know, those three guys we talked about. None of those guys are super offensively. You know, they're not going to. None of those guys are going to go out and get you 15 points a game. So I, I think the ability to only have one of them on the court most of the time it really opens up the opportunities for Tennessee's Tennessee's offense. And, and if Phillips can do uh, just that, and versatility allow him to play the four uh, and kind of be on the wing on offense. I think that uh, just makes Tennessee all the more dangerous uh, team offensively. 
Well, Ryan, I want to keep uh, too much of your take away too much of your time here, but I, I do want to bring up a couple different things that I haven't had a chance to talk about here um, since I've done a podcast in a couple weeks. So I think it was, was it earlier this week? No, it was at the end of September. So late last week where uh, it was announced, I think it was reported first, and then Tennessee officially announced it this week. But Mike Wilson, I saw, and a couple others reporting that Tennessee is going to face Gonzaga in a preseason scrimmage they're going to do over in Frisco, Texas. Uh, proceeds are going to go to charity. You can watch it through pay-per-view. Uh, Tennessee is also going to be facing Michigan State in a you know a secret closed-door practice. I, I wish... I wish the Michigan State one was going to be open to the public too. That was like an exhibition you could watch. But I mean, I, I think it's, it's it speaks a lot to where Tennessee basketball is now uh, as a program that they get Michigan State and Gonzaga as teams to have preseason matches and uh, early season scrimmages. I mean, that that's something that I would never have thought Tennessee basketball would have, would have been able to do. You know, especially like ten years ago, but even even like five six years ago, when I thought Tennessee would have been able to get two you know programs that have competed and. Well, I guess Gonzaga has it. Well, but, you know, teams that are consistently getting deep into the uh, tournament year in, year out, and, and just two teams that have high prestige like Gonzaga and Michigan State. That, I think it's pretty cool. Definitely. And, you know, Tennessee, ever since Rick Barnes has been here, they've played Davidson in their closed door closed door scrimmage. And like you said, not only are we not going to watch that, we won't, you know, get much of anything out of that. That They lock that thing up like the – like, I like guess the CIA secret, and they don't want anything to get out from that scrimmage. But uh, Bob McKillop, who was the longtime coach of Davidson, retired this offseason. So that kind of presented uh, Barnes in Tennessee with an opportunity to go look in, in a different direction. And obviously, I think he's had – Barnes has had a, a relationship with Tom Izzo for a really long time, obviously, too. Uh, long tenured uh, successful college basketball coaches and, and that should be a really interesting test for him and really probably a little bit of a step up you know Davidson obviously has a really good mid-major program but they are you know still a, a mid-major so the face Michigan State will, will be cool and then yeah the Gonzaga game I mean that's that's awesome I'd much rather even though it's not going to be in Knoxville and it'll have to you know watch it probably on what will be a, a not great stream I'd much rather watch that than watch Tennessee <laughs> play Lenore Ryan or, or whoever else they typically play in the exhibition game. And kind of the same way, I think when Barnes was at Texas, he either had exhibition games or did that closed door scrimmage against Gonzaga. And obviously has a really good relationship with Mark Feud. They've played three times since Barnes has been here. They were scheduled to play uh, during that COVID season. And I think when Tennessee or May, I can't remember which team, there was a lot early in that season of COVID pauses for Tennessee. So I can't remember if it was Tennessee or Gonzaga, but one of them, uh, had a COVID issue, so they weren't able to end up playing. But uh, obviously, a uh, prior relationship, and as has kind of been the case for the last half decade, Gonzaga right up there in number one uh, in a lot of preseason preseason rankings. So that's going to be a great, you know, not even early season, a great preseason test for Tennessee and kind of a great opportunity, you know. I'm sure if it was the season opener and it was a real game, Tennessee would be decent underdogs, but they get a chance to kind of test themselves early on. Uh, uh, even early on, like I said, before the season uh, against a, a really good Gonzaga team and kind of see where they stack up without the risk of picking up a loss. Well, I'm going to hold off on doing record predictions and stuff like that kind of near the end of this month since the season will be, will be close to beginning at the end of October. So I'm going to hold off on doing any of that on the show. But I'm curious, Ryan, looking at the schedule for Tennessee, I think it's tough because it's, it's hard to have an easy schedule in uh in division one or as a high major in college basketball but i think it is at least on paper it lines up easier than schedules tennessee's had over the last few years you still have tough non-conference matchups obviously texas being one of them uh, arizona being one of them but i look at kind of the way the schedule lays out for the sec especially for some of the early season stuff for tennessee and you have the battle for atlantis too which i, I will be I, i'll be interested to see if Tennessee and Kansas can end up playing in that or if it'll be you know how that will end up playing out by the time we get to the the third game in that but I think Tennessee's schedule you know it lines up better than the most years have for Tennessee in terms of strength of schedule I think they still have a pretty good strength of schedule I just think the way the games come at you there's not like a big gauntlet at least for now again there probably is going to be a couple teams in the SEC that end up being quite a bit better than we're I'm, ex I'm expecting them to be and teams that we're expecting to be pretty good that end up being more middle of the pack so maybe you know by the time we get to February that changes and all of a sudden you look at the schedule and go oh god there's a gauntlet here that I you know it's gonna be brutal but I think Tennessee's opening to SEC play is 
the easier stretch, whereas that was not the case last year. Tennessee opened up with a really tough slate of games to open up SEC play last year. This year, I think Tennessee can get on a roll in SEC play, and then by the time you get to the second half of this of the SEC schedule, which does look harder than the first half, hopefully that by that point Tennessee has gelled and I think come together and has you know probably hopefully playing better, more consistent. I'm, I'm just curious your thoughts on the schedule because I look at it as a a tough one. But in terms of what Tennessee's had over the last few years, not as tough as it could be. And I think it lines up uh, to hopefully maybe give Tennessee a, a pretty decent shot at a, a fairly high seed in the NCAA tournament. You're right. And Tennessee kind of plays the same number of games against, you know, high quality teams or, you know, power six opponents as they do normally. But I don't think the teams that they are playing this year are as good as they've been necessarily in past years. And again, like you said, we could be surprised by stuff. Arizona was. You know, when you looked at Tennessee's schedule in the preseason last year, Arizona, of the big non-conference teams they played, was supposed to be the worst. They were about the only one that wasn't projected in the tournament, and they ended up being, you know, the hardest one, or one of the hardest ones they faced, and one of the best teams in the country all year. And it's kind of the same way. They're supposed to, uh, I think people were kind of down on them after a lot of the guys that they lost from last year's team, but Tennessee has to go out there and play. So I think you're right that it's a little bit more manageable in the non-conference slate, while at the same time, they're not playing no nobody they're not playing Arkansas schedule and which is disgusting as it as it usually is uh, and then when you turn in and look at the SEC play you're right it's about polar opposite from the start of last year I mean looking at it right now again we're however many months out uh, I can't even do basic arithmetic at this this time of the day but yeah I don't think Tennessee is going to be I think Tennessee is going to be favored in every game in January uh, every SEC game in January and you're right it gets harder from there and uh, particularly to close the last two and a half weeks three weeks of the schedule it is really hard hard but go look at Auburn go look at Alabama go look at Kentucky go look at um, Arkansas that's why go to look at the teams that are supposed to be the best teams in the SEC all their schedules are really hard the last two weeks of the year and that's because the SEC wants the championship to be on the line and they want those teams that are going to be competing for it to be playing each other uh, the last few weeks of the season so that's just the reality of being one of the best programs in the conference you're going to have to end, end the year hard but you're right it, it is certainly an interesting dynamic and I think there's a handful of games that, like Florida, like Texas A&M, where, like LSU, where those teams are probably fringe NCAA tournament teams, probably NCAA tournament teams, uh, where Tennessee goes on the road and plays all three of those teams on the road, where those games were in Knoxville, you'd feel like, yeah, Tennessee is going to win these, this game by, you know, five to ten points. But on the road, those games become near toss-ups, and I think they have a lot of those more – maybe not early in the schedule, but not in that later half of the schedule. So those are kind of the games, again, here, way out looking at it. A lot will probably change, and we'll probably end up looking stupid trying to speculate on who's going to be good and who's who's going to be bad in the conference. But those are kind of the games that I look at as massive swing games that don't stand out as game of the year in the SEC, but games that are, are really going to have a massive impact on uh, if Tennessee can find themselves at the top of the SEC when the regular season comes to a close. Well, Ryan, I just browsed on RTI just to kind of look over there. You all have always just so much stuff over at RTI. So uh, I'll let you kind of close out the uh, your segment here and, you know, let people know kind of stuff. They can go check out at Rocky Top Insider and what you have coming down the wire. And obviously right now we're in football season. So I know a lot of people listening probably are, you know, wanting to hear about football too. So if you want to plug some football stuff, uh, by all means, go ahead. But let everybody know where they can interact with you and where they can find your stuff and what you have coming down the wire. Yeah, over at RockyTopInsider.com, we have tons of stuff, tons of stuff uh, on the football team, the football season. As Tennessee gets ready for a big uh, big two-week stretch, test this weekend at LSU, and then obviously come home to face Alabama as they look to exercise some demons in that game and maybe a little bit more vulnerable Alabama team and maybe a Tennessee team uh, that has the capabilities to uh, take advantage of those vulnerabilities. We'll see. And then uh, basketball uh, practice observations today, some of a lot of that stuff we talked about and some more. One guy that I'll throw out had a really, really nice day was Jemai Meshack. Uh, so I wrote about him some in there. And then we'll have a, really a lot of coverage from the Tennessee basketball preseason. And that media day, you know, shout out to UT Media Relations. It's an awesome event, uh, an awesome event to talk to a lot of people and be able to, to get stuff for stories. So we'll, I'll have, you know, four, I don't know exactly what it'll be, but a lot of stuff that I got from media day coming down the pipe in the next couple of weeks. And then, uh, Tennessee fall baseball too. Probably not where most people's focus is, but uh, they got started last Friday, and uh, we'll have I'll be over there watching a, a lot of their scrimmages this fall, and, and we'll have some periodical coverage of them. So everything you need, and then on the Lady Vols too. I think their media day, and they haven't sent out what the date is going to be, but 
I'm sure it'll be coming out in the next couple of weeks. And Rick Butler and I will uh, be over there. We'll, we'll be providing some coverage, uh, as always, on the Lady Vols this season as well. Yeah, I actually meant to ask you about Jemai May Shack, so I'll have to do that. We'll just have to have you on again, uh, and I can ask you in, in a future one. But uh, you mentioned, really quickly, you mentioned baseball. Uh, the SEC schedule updated the conference schedule. Dude, baseball team has, they have to have the toughest SEC schedule out there. Missouri, a and LSU, Florida, at Arkansas. It's out, also at LSU. Vandy at home, uh, and Mississippi State, at Georgia, Kentucky, at South Carolina. That is, that's brutal, man. That is a rough schedule, so... Uh, this is not a baseball podcast, but I know a lot of listeners out there also like Tennessee baseball. Just want to give you all a heads up that uh, Arkansas got added to the schedule. So love it because I've the Tennessee Arkansas baseball rivalry is fun, man. I love it. So I'm looking forward to it. That's a brutal schedule. But uh, Ryan, thank you all. So, thank you so much for joining me on the, the show today. And thank you all so much for listening and watching the show here as you do every week, hopefully. And then we're getting closer to the season. So once the season begins for both the Vols and Lady Vols, I'll try to do two episodes per week. Might hopefully try to do two this week as well. Again, try to have a, a Lady Vols one this week, if not next week. But again, thank you all so much for the support. Comment your thoughts down below on the YouTube video or uh, you know, come at us on Twitter or Facebook at Vol Hoops Fever on Twitter or Vol Basketball Fever on Facebook if you want to leave us comments and thoughts and opinions on there as well. Signing off for Ryan, a special guest on the show, I am Nathaniel, and this has been another episode of Vol Basketball Fever. Thank you for watching Vol Basketball Fever. Give this video a like and subscribe to the channel while you're here. We appreciate all your support, and the show wouldn't be possible without Vol fans like you. Thank you.